I would love to have seen the like focus group test screenings for this movie. <laughs> Bro, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Go to, go to IMDb. Everyone watching could do this. You could join in at home, click on one star reviews, and you will be oh, go to town. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> It's time for our second episode of Four Play here on the Last Free Nation Culture channel. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, what are you doing with your life? Click the subscribe button right now. It's very helpful. We also have all of our social media links down below, including TikTok. Are you a big TikTok fan, Richard? You know what? You know I love being spied on by China. It's my, it's my favorite thing. So we oh, are. Cut that out, actually. I, I, I love TikTok, man. <laughs> there you go. Um, we're on all uh, short form social media: Twitter at LFN Culture. We post the clips across a variety of different mediums. So thank you very much for your support, your comments, your likes. Very much. We're very much enjoyed by us. Uh, we are in our second week of Cosmic Horror. As many of you know, the concept of foreplay is to select four films and watch them week by week. If you're curious where you can find the list, if you are looking at kind of watching along with us as the weeks go by, uh, we both have that on our social media, especially Twitter, and we have it now in a community post here on the YouTube channel. So keep an eye open for that. If you guys go onto the YouTube channel for Last Free Nation Culture, click on the community tab. That is where you can find information about which movies we're doing coming up so you can watch ahead and enjoy it. I know a lot of you have been looking for us to guide you through the world of these cinematic genres, and we will do just that. So this week, we are on Annihilation. After doing the thing last week, this is a 2018 film, so it's the most recent film we're going to be looking at in the cosmic horror genre. And then we will start to go back in time again. And it will uh, it's directed by Alex Garland, who famously wrote the Gen X Lord of the Flies-esque novel The Beach, which then got turned into a Leonardo DiCaprio movie later on. Uh, but more recently, has actually, I, I hadn't seen this movie, which is weird because I really like some of his other movies, including oh, yeah. su including Sunshine, which he wrote, which is another movie that we might have done for this cosmic horror. It was on, on the table for this cosmic film, horror. Yeah. And 28 Days Later is probably my favorite zombie movie. Ex Machina, which he both wrote and directed, is one of my favorite movies of the last decade. And yet somehow I had missed Annihilation. Very weird. Mm. Well, I, I actually, maybe well, not. Maybe, maybe it's intended. I, I, I think, I think Annihilation, and we'll probably touch upon it, it. It was a super difficult movie to even sort of get made, and it was a super difficult movie to market specifically. And I think probably, you know, we're going to have varied opinions on the film. And I, you know, I had people messaging me before this episode saying, "Can't wait to hear you dunk on this movie." And I'm, I'm not going to dunk on the movie. I, I think this is one of the most misunderstood. It. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the most misunderstood movies of the last ten years, and it it, it reveals a lot of the inherent problems with Amer the American cinematic process. Okay, well, before I mean, we one get thing into, I would say, oh, oh, go on. I was going to bring up the premise, but you go first, Duncan. Mm. Right. First of all, remember, we always do spoilers on this show. And we will actually in depth talk about things yes. like the ending and all the rest of it. So Monty in a minute will set up the actual like what happens in the movie. Basically, the reason why at the outset, I'll just put my cards on the table. I don't think this is a good movie. Like I think it's actually I don't think it's a bad movie. For me, it is an experience. And I would in theory yeah. have that experience once. I had it twice because I wanted to like be refreshed about what happened in the story. I actually have to say I did remember a lot of it, not necessarily specifically, but sort of the vibe and what I thought of it was almost the same when I rewatched it. I will say it was one where the rewatch was bad it was almost the same experience again the actual analog and the touchstone i'm going to use in in this movie many many times as i reference my experience of what it what it was like some of the problems that rich is talking about with the movie and how it was received is basically if you've ever seen the two andrea tarkovsky movies solaris yes. and stalker mm -hmm. it's essentially mm -hmm. like a mishmash of both and i always tell people when i first watched especially stalker when i was young because it's always mega hyped in the sci-fi genre i had a similar experience I was sort of like oh, what's going on like there's nothing going on in the plot and what is the point of that and what I had to realize was that's not the way that Tarkovsky makes movies he doesn't no. make plots he doesn't make like character development what he does essentially is he makes like an experience you just absorb and you're sort of actually there in the movie essentially and then there are, there might be look in his there's more actually like verbalized philosophy and sort of ponderings and stuff there isn't really any of that this is actually part of the reason I think people couldn't handle it like they wanted mm. they wanted someone at some point to tell them what was going on with that like alien at 
at the end and, and why was it like mirroring <laughs> oh her and then, God, and then why was it like the, why was the bear screaming and, that, and the point is I'm just going to say this at the outset like a talk you're never going to get an answer to that that's not even as far as I can tell the premise of what you're doing like actually it's a bit like what I said about the thing one where it makes you the viewer have the paranoia like they do it's a similar yeah. thing here you're also confused and you're experiencing like weird fractured things happening and there is never an answer in fact the whole point is there basically aren't answers as far as I can tell so essentially if you go in with a traditional westerners all just want a plot characters <laughs> development and then a, a like conclusion there's none of that basically there's no. barely characters by the way even. like they don't even really attempt to like explore too yeah. much so i would just say going in understand like this isn't going to be like get some popcorn some drinks get the boys around like this is actually one you watch on your own and you might not like it even though you might actually still appreciate the experience yeah i yes. i agree with you i agree with you thorin and and it, for me it wasn't that i thought that this was particularly successfully done, but I just appreciated its ambition. And I would much mm. rather watch a movie that tries to be really ambitious and kind of fails rather than watch the average schlock or, or blockbuster, right? Because at the end of the day, you can decide whether you like or don't like this movie. I'm not sure which one it is for me, honestly, but it, this makes you think at the very least. And so I would recommend watching it, even if I don't think it's the best film or even among the best films or even 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 if I like it. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> the more yeah. I think about it, it wouldn't it wouldn't make my top 100 by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. But in terms of it being misunderstood, because it is a mainstream American cinematic attempt to adopt. I mean, Tarkovsky is a brilliant comparison because it's 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 cinema using the language of metaphor. Right. Yeah. Like and, and, and American audiences don't fuck with that. <laughs> they want Tom Cruise. They've made well... that abundantly clear. You know what I mean? I, I think it's just about kind of the level of engagement in an in literary style analysis that i'm not sure mm. it's about americans i think it's just about what people desire out of film and honestly yeah, and a lot of people Brit i'll throw brooks uh, in there as well I'm a lot of a lot of people just want escapism not challenging pieces of art right mm, so sure. i think i think that's that's just it um, I mean, you could argue this is incredibly escapist. It's just the point is, it's not like you're not being guided around like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. You you are just suddenly on an alien planet and you've yes. got to figure it all out yourself. That's basically what I mean. Okay, so let's talk about the premise of this mm -hmm. film. Um, the premise is that there is a meteorite that strikes this lighthouse in the Florida panhandle in some kind of national park or nature preserve. And... When this happens, it unleashes what is effectively kind of this force field uh, that continues to grow in size over time. And they have sent basically the U.S. government doesn't know what it is. It's called the shimmer because it has this kind of like oil stain prismatic effect uh, if you walk through this barrier and they don't know why it's ex it's expanding. So they've sent soldiers uh, through this. Nobody except for one person who is Oscar Isaac's character, who we'll talk about briefly, and the husband of of Natalie Portman's character. And Natalie Portman is kind of the central character of this film who comes back out. He's like a special ops soldier. He comes back out, except he doesn't have any memory of going in or where he's been. And he's been disappeared for a year and everybody presumed he was dead. Um, so the start of the movie is kind of him coming back home after this year of being lost and then uh, having a medical episode, which then gets the government black SUVs to kidnap him and Natalie Portman, who's in the ambulance, take them to the observation site in Florida that's overlooking this thing. And then Natalie Portman gets dragged into a cadre of other female scientists She's a, a, a biologist or a doctor at Johns Hopkins, a, a professor in biology, and she gets dragged in with various other uh, female scientists. So it's a crew of all women who are going into the shimmer in order to try and reach the lighthouse and figure out what is going on uh, when all other missions have been unsuccessful. And so the bulk of the movie is their travels towards this lighthouse, the impact zone, and all of the very strange things they experience and encounter along the way. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, basically, yeah, uh, I'll make the illusion already. This is why I say to me, the two more obvious touchstones for me are Solaris and Stalker, because Stalker is about a zone where some maybe some meteorite has landed or something, and with it, when you enter this zone, all laws of physics and nature sort of just go out the window, like you can sort of go down the same path, and if you don't know where you're going, you end up in the same place again, even though, like, what the hell, I didn't do, like, a, I didn't circle back, though. You go to areas, and it's like there's almost like a, con, a confusing element to it, and you have to have someone guide you through, and then if people don't know, in Solaris, that is a movie where the whole premise is you are experiencing some alien other that you're not quite sure what it is, but the way it communicates to you, a human, is by taking the memories of your loved ones, perhaps ones that are lost back on Earth, and it uses them as its way to try and reach out and communicate with you and have some sort of parlance. And it basically marries those two concepts in this movie. And so I thought, well, that was... I've never... Basically, I can't think of almost any other movies that it has any relevance to, but if you know those two movies, you will definitely definitely get vibes of that as it goes on. I even think, by the way, the whole Florida angle, that's almost a complete illusion to Stalker, where it's all just this green, you're just in this green area where you're just going through wildlife, but there's like this tension of there could be like the supernatural at work. Or And one thing, as a quick thing to see this before we get into it, is another area that an American audience is going to completely get lost about halfway into this movie, is they're going to make the mistake of thinking it's a specific alien or like yeah. there's something out the way. What you're going to essentially learn, the, the key thing they say the whole movie is when the sort of botanist type person or whoever it was I can't remember if she was the geologist or botanist the one who's the African American woman when she basically says that actually it wasn't ever the case that the radio signals weren't making it out essentially this area is a prism that somehow refracts everything communications genes and so that's another area you're going to get lost in it's not that like a woman turned into a bear and at the end they it's like essentially it's all just like blowing and that's why essentially spoiler straight to the end at the end when they do because they Listen, they had to give something to American audiences at the end, right? Instead of being like they hug and that's like, they're evil. You just see in the eyes, like, oh, there's some of it still in them. And it's like, and essentially everything that goes in gets changed. So there never was any, you're going to go in as a distinct entity, find an answer slash save someone, come back out and tell people. As soon as you enter, just like when we watch this experience of the movie, you can never exit the same again. You will just be changed irrevocably. And there isn't really an answer as far as I can tell. Yeah, and, and, you know, look, the other thing to note is, obviously, this was adapted from a novel, uh, you know, and um, and the novel is very, very different. A lot of stylistic choices that are completely different. Now, Alex Garland read the novel once, but he read it years ago, and he said, I, I'm not going to reread it before I adapt the movie because I want the movie to have this ethereal, dreamlike quality, which is, you know, as I remember the book. And so, you know, he... It, <laughs> He has created, a, you know, a story that unfortunately, because of American sensibilities, it does have a beginning that is silly yep. and an end that has what people think is a twist, but, but it isn't. <laughs> oh, no. No, and I've seen, I've seen this movie described as ambiguous <laughs> and it's absolutely fucking not. It couldn't be more explicit. <laughs> It's in too what explicit it's... in many ways, in my opinion. Yeah, well, look, so again, cards on the table. There's two ways to read this movie, and it's cancer as cosmic horror yep. or trauma as cosmic horror. You know, you, By the way, you, this is yep, where, like, the thing, you've got to realise, they, they do understand no matter how art house you get, if it's going to be mainstream, you better mm. actually be like, this is why, though. The, the movie begins with her going, so the cancer cells I know, begin. It's so... and, and they saw later, like Richard says, explicitly that exact thing of her blood going and breaking. And again, if you can't, look, I don't need to diss your intelligence, but if you couldn't put those two scenes together at <laughs> yeah. the beginning and the end, then no, nothing else we say can help you at this point in time. That's that's the life preserver. Well, Already been, it's never learn to swim. There's a life preserve. You didn't even grab it, so I, I can't help you now. I mean, I do appreciate to your point, Richard, <laughs> that the two different interpretations that you're laying out, right? That trauma causes a drive for self destruction, but and yes. the, the the cancer analogy, because to explain why the cancer analogy works, guys, basically when they go into the shimmer and Thorin's point about the physicist character saying that everything, including communications, is getting um, basically mixed up as if it was going through a prism and there's this refraction. Uh, it is very, very, very explicit in this film that that's what's going on. And in fact, I think it's not ambiguous enough, Richard, because as you point out, the, she literally, so the, the character Lena, who's Natalie Portman's character, is giving a lecture at Johns Hopkins, which if you're not American or don't know, this is a very famous uh, 
uh, medical university. So it has a very famous medical program to for to and train people it, to become it, doctors. In, in the novel, everyone who comes back from the shimmer has cancer. Yes. That's, oh, that's, right. oh, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, 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 so the cancer lecture is the Chekhov's gun. Yes. Like they didn't do that for no reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, well, look, look, there's tons you know? of Chekhov's guns in here, guys. So let yeah. me. Let and me I, and I'm glad they didn't make it that in the film, frankly. I yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they do have Ventress, who's uh, Jennifer Jason yes. Lee's character, who they just explicitly say has cancer. So there's that interpretation where they go into the Shimmer, and basically the genes of everything are getting messed up. So. Uh, it's and they also talk about cell division. And so when they when they go in and you see all of these creatures that are mutations, basically, some of which is very beautiful. I mean, the set design, which I'm sure we'll get into, is is lovely in many ways. And the visual appeal of this movie is awesome. Yeah. Um, and so you have all these like twisted creatures like the shark alligator or the the skull bear that screams the hybrid human bear, voice. Yeah. yeah yeah so you have you have all these things that are that are mutations and then which leads into like the cancer angle and cells dividing in ways that they're not supposed to and potentially devouring their hosts which we see in some of the people that go in uh, as we'll talk about but you also see the trauma angle which again is rather ham-fistedly done in my opinion because when they're just sitting in the boat and shepherd one of the other women is just telling Lena, all of the trauma that everyone else has. It's like, oh, yeah, this person uh, was self-harming and this person has cancer and I lost my daughter. And it's just like it's kind of this laundry list of trauma where then you're that's supposed to make you think more about the characters. But it's just one character listing traumas of other characters and it's not very well shown. This is not exactly something you do if your life is in perfect harmony. We're all damaged goods here. Anya Soper, they're for an addict. Josie wears long sleeves because she doesn't want you to see the scars in her forearms. So it's really hard to actually feel anything for the characters or sympathize with them afterwards. Yeah, and, and I don't think you're supposed to. Again, in the novel, the characters don't even have names. Okay, that's right? fair. So, but, but for me, uh, I think, like, I don't know if I'm reading way too much into this, right? But like... Hear me out, okay? So, okay, we've got a script. It's about cancer or trauma. It's called Annihilation. It's about both. It, it's about both, let's it, be clear. It's yeah, very well, explicitly about Ca ORF. Yeah. It, it's it's yeah, supposed yeah, yeah, to be yeah. both things at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it's, 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 and, and it's about annihilation. Like what happened, you know, cancer kills you. You It, it literally annihilates you. Uh, Self-destructive behavior, trauma, that annihilates you if you let it. It's about overcoming these things and how it changes you, right? And so as a result, I think the characters are meant to be these archetypes because you have five main characters that are very broad in, like you said, barely personality at all. Uh, but they have one trait typically. And, and usually that is just a sign of bad writing but this is alex garland he's a good writer so i don't think he's doing that i i, I think i think they're meant to be the five stages of grief like i know this is like sure. oh richard okay. you've lost your mind but no no, no, no i think that's i think i think that makes sense but it's a one character's yeah. literally in denial the whole movie well yeah it's like anger is yeah yeah and they the i mean that's really on the nose too though richard <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's really because there's literally that part where they're talking about and we're dealing with this in different ways and you lena are the one who's fighting it and then the 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 physicist uh is the one who just like kind of walks off and just accepts it and turns into nature right so i yeah, i'm so exactly. continue. Single, there is an angle to that that i actually enjoyed that part when you meet those characters because here's the thing another reference immediately cultural reference on aliens when you meet the crew that the yeah. vibe you're getting the posse vibe you come yeah. in you're the new one and it's like literally by the way that woman may as well even be the woman from aliens like she even looks like her like i said you <laughs> yeah. got the badass bitch who's gonna have all the guns <laughs> and she's like Fuck it. yeah and, you, and you've got like you're, you're more pensive you can like who's the professor character so like it's all the classic archetypes you do in a movie basically yeah but i but i but i think as well as i said i, I think i think what they were going for here is like they're not characters they're they're they're, they're metaphor you know that so so what 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 is happening is this is about lena's journey through a trauma her trauma in the movie which we, we again will point out is she thought her husband was dead yeah. and cheated on him she yes uh, and i think people miss that part no one ever mentions that richard like the actual fact yeah. she's having an affair is pretty key to it, it but she was yeah, she was having the affair before her husband left Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so the way, 
and and it's it's sort of alluded to i think using like the again the language of cinema i think it's alluded to you know she's a she's a very sexual person like all of her memories of her husband are in the bedroom uh before you know when she wakes up in the tent um you know she's dreaming of sex she's having an a literal orgasm and you know so so I, I think i think what happened essentially was you know she's she's feeling guilty for cheating on her husband who's now dead and or dying you know quite crucially she says why are you going in the shimmer you know and it she doesn't say to help him to find a cure she says i owe him right she's yes. she, she's indebted to him because of her infidelity she has cheated on him and it is ter and, and thought she's lo lost him and the guilt has tore her up it's it's trauma that was a brave choice I owed him. I'm only trying to understand what drove you. I owed him. So I went in. So, you know, the the film is re really her journey to, I would argue she's acceptance. She's the one that comes out the other side, she confronts the alien, which again is a, re a manifestation of her actual trauma. It turns into her in the same way trauma, you know, it be you become your trauma. And then she destroys it. And at the end, the little shimmer in her eyes as she hugs her husband, who is also changed for his experience, you know, it it's saying I I'm not the same person, but I, I haven't been annihilated. I am the same. And so I guess the reason I fuck with this movie is like, you know, it, it speaks to me on a very like personal level, you know, like someone that's kind of gone through like a lot of stuff and, you know, it, it's, it's about getting to I mean, the you other can't side. You go back to the that. other person, right? You have to become, yeah, you you have to accept become the new person. Yeah, yeah. There's that line. I wrote it down. Um, when she went, when, when um, it's Shepard, right? She says that she lost her daughter to leukemia. And she said, it's two bereavements, my beautiful girl and the person I once was. And, and, and so that is what it's like. That's what trauma is like. You have a traumatic experience and then you are not you anymore. And you have to learn to live with this version of you because you are still you, but you're a different you. And so, you know, I, I, I think it, it sort of blows my mind a little bit that people look at this and what they want is feminine predator because <laughs> of how, oh, they did. It was even how like the that, movie's yeah. coded. Yes. It's like it's women yes. in the jungle with guns. And, and like it, it, because of that, I think people come at this movie with like really fucked up expectations. And I get a whiff of studio interference, that crocodile scene 30 minutes in where the giant crocodile comes out the water, you get a jump scare. Ready? In this really silly bit where they're on the knee shooting it and there's no blood spurting out and Natalie Portman's got a slow motion. That's bad. That is in, that is objectively bad. But I think they put that in there for the morons that are like, you know, they're going to go on YouTube after this movie and go, is she an alien? And, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with Monty. MP. I would actually, for real, improve this movie by taking any exposition out. Like, you know, yes. when they go to that base camp and it's like, wait, look, there was all these people. It's like Carter, Thingamajig, Kane, Kane, remember my husband, Kane, my husband, yeah, he was there as well, like, bro, like, you don't even need that, like, if you take that out, I'd even take out the scene at the end with the cells, if you just take these things out, actually, the mystery of the movie is better in some ways, you know yeah, what I mean, yeah, like, and, and it's there, the same experience. There, there, You can be a lot more subtle about it, so here's a great example of the subtlety of this movie when it's done right. So at the very beginning, when Oscar Isaac's character comes back home, unexpectedly when they think he had died he's sitting at this table in the ha in their house so him and, and natalie portman character so kane and lena's house together and he has his hands in front of this glass of water and there's this very there's a shot that's just his hands in the water and i was sitting there watching this for the first time with my wife and i said why are they so obsessed with this refraction shot because it's showing his hands in two different positions simultaneously because of the refraction of the water and later obviously that's highly symbolic of how the refraction of his dna within the shimmer changed him and at the yeah. end of the film so the film is interspersed with a variety of shot of scenes with lena doing an interrogation after she emerges from the shimmer and at the very end of that they do the exact same shot of her hands through a glass of water at the end to show that 
symbolically, she had been through the same transformation that Kane, her husband, had been through. And I thought that is a really good yeah. way to foreshadow at the start of the movie and then later on to show that she had been through the same procedure where they might look the same on the outside, but there is this symbol of refraction through the glass of water. And to me, that's a really cool visual symbol and is much more what I liked about this movie than the ham-fisted Here's some cells dividing. Cancer cells, cancer cells. My daughter died of cancer. Also, Ventress has cancer. Here's our list of traumas that we experienced. Feel bad for us. As if just listing a few traumas is enough to send five people on what is effectively a suicide mission into this shimmer. That's why, though, I didn't actually... I wasn't sort of like, here's the one thing about the movie... I'd, after maybe the first time when the alligator grabs them and it looks like it could just be like female predator and let's just shoot with guns and yours have gotten big enough. After that scene, I actually was never really sort of like scared or with tension for any of the characters. I was never like, oh shit, I hope they make it all the time. I just wanted to see what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen next? And so essentially to me, yeah. they had set it up that everyone was on a suicide. It was like, we all have nothing left to lose. Like, as you say, she doesn't go, I'm going in to get answers or to save. It just goes like, basically I have to, like after what, basically because I've cheated on him and he's had this fucked up experience and I've lost him and myself may as well just fucking go in may as well like I'm, I'm sort of the last per best person for the job and so the funny thing is I actually the ultimate thing I disagree with is the title of the fucking movie because to me actually this has parallels to when they explain in the thing what the thing was doing the fact that it wasn't just like killing you and pretending to be you it was taking your DNA and then creating mm. a version because the part everyone misses about the thing is why at the end does it still have the dog inside of it and that comes out as well it's like Richard says if you go and read the whatever the treaty that someone did as a story where it was from the POV of the thing. That's how it thinks it communicates with people. It sort of takes your form, absorbs yeah. it, then shows it back to you. And th it's almost like a cat bringing you a dead rat, like, look, I'm doing this for you, mate. And you're like, oh, okay, what the fuck? That's disgusting. So I would say, actually, I would call this movie assimilation. That's it to me. But yeah. as we're talking about with the stages, it's not that you assimilate that into you. You must allow yourself to be assimilated into it. And also the key point I feel like people miss in this, it's in the dialogue, is the I Oscar Isaac's character also just says too much if you're actually listening. At the end, when he sets off the, like, phosphorus grenade or whatever, he basically says a bit of dialogue that is a, not a monologue. It's dialogue. He sort of goes, like, am I you or are you me? And then says something like, oh, we're going to have to do that. And he said, it basically implies like everyone who went in, everyone gets refracted and mixed up in a way. And he isn't himself. He's not Kane at the end. And so even though you're going to think if you've been watching it like a predator, right, the reason he blows himself up is to kill the alien. It's like, no, since you at that point, he doesn't exist. Or if he does, like I even took that, the last scene of them meeting inside the sort of like fucking Area 51 type content, by the way, it's classic US tropes. Like aliens come to earth. The American government have contained them completely. And they have <laughs> men in black. Like, that that's fucking out of every movie ever. But, and they do that, right? It's not like they meet each other and go, holy shit, we're alive. Like, I love you so much. They both walk over really awkwardly and hug as if, like, we are the same thing and just sort of look like... And then that... And then well, they really... The last line. He says, the she eyes. goes, are you Kane? Are you later? Yeah. And yeah, they right. really do overplay. They're like... Like they do, the, the joke is there. They may as well have even like zoomed in and do some music. <laughs> okay, I get, I get it. I get well, it. Well, that's that's why that's why I liked the uh, the refraction shot in the glass with the water that they did with both of them because that's enough symbolism right there. You don't need okay. the like glimmer in the eyes at the end. It's just like it's so well, dumb. But, but let me let me just inject some levity here, right? Because we're, we're obviously. You know, we're just patting ourselves on the back, self fellation We're like that fucking brainlet uh, fucking <laughs> meme, you know, <laughs> where we're just smoking a pie, playing chess with ourselves, awesome. right? But, like, look, people didn't get it. That's no, the I can key. imagine. So I, I went and got, like, I I'll just read you this. Yeah, I would love to have seen the, like, focus group test screenings for this movie. <laughs> Bro, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Go, go, go to IMDb. Everyone watching could do this. You could join in at home. Click on one star reviews and you will be. Oh, go to town. Oh, oh boy. Here's one. Here's one, right? Imagine this being your review of this movie. No gloves, no flashlights. It is just disappointing that movies like this don't cover the basics. Touching clearly contaminated organisms with bare hands as a biologist is completely ludicrous. Or to step into water with a mutated body and put your hand on it. And of course, running after an unknown beast in the dark and having no flashlights. Pff, of course. 
When did movie makers become so lazy and inept? The same was the movies like Alien Prometheus, exploring an alien planet without protective gear. I lost interest halfway through due to irritation. The bad reception is quite earned. It was lazy and boring and unrealistic. I like. And then this... there was one more review. What? Okay, just one line. I love that. Okay. Just one line. <laughs> I mean, this right annihilated <laughs> one hour and fifty-five minutes of my life. He did get but... a bang up at the end. That line wasn't bad. At least he worked in the title. That no, that, that was okay. a separate review. The other guy was obsessed with the okay. gloves and flashlights. Right, okay. I, I like how this guy's like, know. it's too yeah. boring, but I would rather have uh, scientific procedures done where they just decontaminate everything. It's like, you want this movie to be more boring? Yeah, let's watch a scene where they put on a hazmat suit and slowly examine nice, something. Guys, That's what... i into the metaphor for trauma right now. Get your, <laughs> get your anti-trauma gear on. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, So, unfortunately, audiences bounce off this movie like a rubber ball because they don't they're not it's like Duncan says this is an experience and, and and i think if you've ever had like i think if you've ever been through something fucked up i think you will vibe with this movie a lot more than if you haven't but also as well i sort of like the way that you know each of the characters as you said i get it's a laundry list how it's introduced as exposition i guess there is no i mean yeah they could they have that scene where you see a self-harm scars they could have just left it at that without explicitly saying in a few scenes you will see some self-harm scars. <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah i get it right like i'm, I'm not i'm not saying this is a, a, a flawless masterpiece but you know it covers the bases you've got you know the loss of somebody dying and you was a former addict right so all of her behavior is through that lens angry paranoia she turns on the team holds them hostage you've got uh josie the self-harm scars who essentially her death is a peaceful suicide right yep. um uh, ventress riddled with cancer can't be asked <laughs> she but, is by despair. the way I just, just as in terms of the acting, like big shout out to Jennifer Jason Lee, she's who great. again crushes it in this movie. Yeah. Holy she is shit, so she's great. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really hot. Like another reason I think this movie, you know, people bounce off it. God bless her heart, Natalie Portman. And she she's tries. Just just I mean, she... yeah, and it's like ah, you know, you can definitely coax a good performance out of her for sure. You know, I think like Black Swan, I know people are probably going to think that's a controversial no, that's opinion. Um, you know, because I've heard her criticized for that, but I think that's like a really good performance. Okay. Um, but, but you know, I, I, I think an actor, like I wonder if they're looking at the dailies and going, yeah, she's just not doing anything with her face. We're going to have to write a line. <laughs> We're going to have to put some exposition in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, self-harm, self-harm. Yeah, yeah. So, like, because it, it's just silly, right? Like, it, it, that, I think it did need someone with a bit more gravitas to really sell Yeah, this. I mean, the joke is you'd rather swap the two roles. Yeah, Have for Jenna sure. Have Jason Leigh play the main character. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. I, I, I think the thing about Natalie Portman is that she... She's often just used as kind of the the straight woman against mm. a background of character actors. And so it, I think what she does, and it's going to be weird to say, is that she provi provides kind of like a baseline standard performance and that allows mm. other actors to shine around her, even if she is yeah, oftentimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oftentimes quite boring. Um, mm. I, and, I, and I also find it very weird that she increasingly is playing more kind of badass characters as she was supposed to do in this film. But the way that audiences, so her, her chief kind of parody of herself was obviously those very famous clips on Saturday night live of her doing mm. super violent raps about how much of a badass she is because it stretches belief that this like tiny woman who seems so harmless could be like this thug basically right yeah. and so it's weird that her her acting arc and her satire arc have kind of reached the same point now i find that mm -hmm. odd where now she yeah. actually way, is oh, just playing badass <laughs> characters what like what's up with that by the way one other thing i did think was another parallel because richard was talking about if you've had a certain experience then you just you know you know if you know you know to me the other vibe i got about this movie is if you've ever had a very strong psychedelic experience like this is like a mega yeah. heavy mushroom trip where you have time dilation you forget like was it did i do it like half an hour ago was it two, wait, how many hours has it been time slows down it speeds up remember they're asking at the beginning like how did you survive for like four months you only had a, and there's like what do you mean i thought we we're in there a few weeks or days or whatever they also the idea 
idea of loss of identity. It's not just that like you're in there. Like, this is the thing, if people true. have never yeah. had this, that won't understand it. It's not just that you're in there and everything else changed like a cartoon, like it was always presented in the 60s. You're the one changing. In fact, for some people, I personally don't get the open eye visuals. I get them if I do the clothes. That. So when, since I don't get the open eye, it's actually me that gets changed by the psychedelic. It's not my external thing. In fact, the funny thing is, I know that this is still my apartment or that is still like a TV screen or so. It's just that what it means, the labels have gone. They just got, and I, I can't relate to it as what the item is. So to me, there's also another concept if you've gone deep enough on these things, which is the next layer is the idea that you're contacting some other. Now the question becomes, mm. this is the philosopher's sort of paradox, is it actually an alien other, an entity, something else out there, an external thought, or is it like your own soul externalized and you can communicate with it? That's something I thought heavily was within this movie. Like when you're like sort yeah. of two thirds through, especially when they're doing things like, another thing people miss is this, because they all have a different architect, the characters, they all engage with it in a different way. So the person who's a soldier, they're just shooting everything. And so they are getting attacked all the time. That's right. By the end, Natalie Portman's character, it's just copying her and doing similar things and trying to sort of like become her. There's another, the despair character, she just she gets to just go all the way into the very center. And nothing, remember, they could bring the hybrid bear type thing and kill her. Some sort of, no one goes to kill her because she's just going in. She's accepting that's going to be this way. She gets to go all the way in the center and then she's even waiting. Classic horror trope. She's like right by, you know, the gates to hell or like the ultimate bad guy. <laughs> and she's the one just sort of like, you know, abandoned all hope, ye who went to here. I am, yeah, you know, exactly. I'm, I am your mayor steward to tell you this is all fucked up. Anyway, I'm just off now, you know, like, and also I will say one part that's mad underrated, just like I said about the thing, everyone's going to ignore the soundtrack, right? Now, I do think overplaying that, like, Foxy, like, and I know that I died in Iraq, like, that, they overplay that a little bit, but the bit at the end, when they're doing the, like, big alien thing, where it's got some sort of, like, future electro garage yeah. type fucking, that's fucking fire. That really looks really well with those, like, it, it gives it a really ominous feeling for a movie. If you'd have stood it with a traditional score, it wouldn't be the same movie. Yeah, totally. Uh, you know, I mean, look, so the good things are definitely stuff, as you say, like the, the sound design. Yeah, some of the lyrics in that fucking song is a bit much It's a bit over well. the top, you know, they laid it on a bit thick. Yeah, 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 that's fair. That is fair, because the, the, the song is explicitly saying what's in the movie as well, which is a bit cringe. Uh, but, <laughs> right, okay, I'll give you that one. See, <laughs> how you bested me there, sir. But no, I, but like some of the, like as you said earlier, the cinematography in this movie, it is like lush, decadent, the design. Like some of these shots look like painting. So they are like fucking gorgeous. It's what I say, like the Tarkovsky movie. If you're just watching it going, well, there's nothing happening, they're in a field. What's yeah. going on? No, no, you're supposed to literally like it. Like here's, here's a stat I heard the other day, and this will explain to you why people can't appreciate art of the plebs. Supposedly, when people go to a museum, they look at a painting on average for seven seconds, then walk away. The print, like, bro, what are you going to get in seven seconds? You know what I mean? Like, the idea yeah. of a great painting is you just take it in. You take it in almost until it washes over you. Like, that's what you got to do with these scenes. It's a bit like I'll give yeah. you another classic one that people think is a boring movie. The movie Barry Lyndon by Hugh Kubrick. Yeah. If you know how Mega. he made it, he's making every scene to be like a, a fucking classic picture from like the 18th century. So you're not supposed to go, well, get, get to the point. Like, no, no, watch this. Look at the scene. Look at the framing. Look at, like, you could pause each frame and he's done it as if it was like a fucking classical thing. Like, they're all sitting around a table gambling, you know, like those classic images. So it's the same with this vibe. I get the vibe. If, you, if it seems really slow, moving and nothing's happening that what what is happening is the point of the movie you're supposed to take yeah. that in. you're not supposed to hope an action scene happens next sort of well it, it also we, i mean that's talking sorry the, go on. yeah that's the thing about that makes this cosmic horror too and what we talked about last hmm. week about the genre is that it is supposed to be this ambiguous motivation oftentimes and it's not necessarily bad it just kind of is right mm. and part of this is obviously for people who enter the shimmer and who undergo mutations and who get attacked by terrifying creatures that have been hybridized right it is very scary but at the same time, you have to appreciate the beauty of all of these flowers that are uh, weaving together into these crazy new uh, into these crazy new hybrids and the animals like the deer with the flowers on their antlers that are just objectively quite beautiful or 
um, the hybrid of the flower and the human DNA where the flowers are are making, you know, weaving themselves into human-like shapes made out of flowers. And so there's a lot of beauty here as well. And that you you need that time that you're talking about, Thorne, to appreciate that because otherwise it seems really just 100% terrifying when mm. this just goes to show that this world in the shimmer is not designed to kill people. That it's is not a, malevolence. It's yeah, not exactly. malevolent. It's just a yes. byproduct of yes. the transformation that is taking place. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think that's why people are going to have a hard time. They're going to think it's a bad guy or something evil. Exactly. It has yeah. to be stopped. Whereas that, to me, that like, I've, I figured out quite early on, that's, it was never about that. No. And, and you know, it's like, it, yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's like it has to have certain tropes. But the tropes don't work because there is no antagonist. You know, you, they're setting it up. Like, unfortunately, the beginning, which, again, I've heard people say, oh, it was really good for the first 30 minutes. <laughs> it's like the worst part. The well, second is the thing, worst Just part. as an aside, for people who've watched episode one, I'm good at callbacks. Even though it's totally applicable in this movie, when the spaceship came in, I couldn't help but think of that stupid shit from the thing that we were talking about last week. I was yeah. like, oh, they're doing it again. What the hell? Yeah. It's the same it's always the same shot what the fuck but, that, but, that, 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 yeah. but that, that's that's the problem it's like unfortunately this script as you said you know it do you know what it should have started with it should have it should have started with the infidelity right i don't like the framing device of her being interrogated post shimmer i don't like no, that. No. I, don't think, I don't think that works you know it should have started it should have started with the infidelity said absolutely nothing about it you all think you're watching a slice of life drama then her husband's going to get back from Iraq, have a medical episode. Why is that? He's been on classified ops. Then you find out about, oh, he's been in this place called the fucking Shimmer. And they should have just done it linearly, I think. I don't think the time jumps work at all. That's and, why, and by I, the way, I'll keep going. I'll, I'll come in after. No, no, and I'm just going to say, and I, and I think, unfortunately, setting it up as, you know, the, the, the this, this, I defeated an antagonist. Now, let me tell you, a room full of hazmat yes. scientists. Let me tell you about my... I, I really think, unfortunately, they've had to do that to try and market the movie in a mainstream way. I would, This movie, it needs a director's cut. I would be very yes. intrigued to see what changes they would make. And the joke sure. is, it would actually be a cut. Like, you would actually yes. take things out. It wouldn't yeah. be that you'd add in more scenes. That it's okay. you'd, you, would, you would remove. Because that's actually the thing. I never thought of that angle before. Because if you notice, me and Richard have a different approach. I like to just watch it myself and try and see what I come up with. Richard actually goes and explores, like, what did, they, uh, what did the director think? What was the writer's past projects? What did they say in the press? What was the initial response to it? What was fine? I never look into any of that stuff. So I'm just kind of in my own solipsistic world. That's just the way I, I operate. Yeah. And so I, what, yeah. So what I, I just this intent is like, you know, I always like to find that out okay. because I think the intent of the art, because I, I think you judge a movie's success really on what the artist was going for <laughs> and what they actually achieve. You know, do okay. I get the same set? What, did, did they make me feel what I'm supposed to feel? And, you know, Alex, Alex Garland, funnily enough, he did say, as far as he's concerned, it, it's a movie all about self-destruction. It's a movie about okay. self-destructive behavior. He doesn't, it, 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 you know, he didn't put the cancer thing out there, you know, or whatever. So it's kind of I don't believe that for two seconds, given... Thing what, is, so yeah, I think Richard's like, angle's yeah. interesting because it does actually reframe the movie a bit for me because I thought actually some of the clumsy things, they do seem like the thing that were just added. Like, essentially, if yeah. you did it the way Richard said, the joke is people aren't even given the review at the end. They just leave the cinema 20 minutes in. Like, what the fuck this shit? And so I would say this. The reason why I could believe that is because if you've ever seen his most famous movie, Ex Machina, that's mm. actually a movie which also is about a very slow unfolding. Let's keep the actual information to the minimum at the beginning let's gradually reveal but then crucially you're not just like revealing something that like ah, i can see where that's going you can never guess whether the piece of information leads so i actually think in his other movie which i imagine he had more control of it's just a classic like robot ai concept that people get and the framing's a lot easier to accept i feel like in that movie he was a lot more subtle with how he drew the story out and where it was going yep. and revealing the different aspects of whereas in this one it did feel like he made a movie like that and at the end someone said like right we're going to get like loads of these things from the second half of the movie and just sort of make people understand at the beginning what's going to happen because essentially what they understood like Richard said is 
it subverts all the tropes and the preconditioned like movie archetypes. So if you allow it to subvert it, people will just be like, this sucks. So instead you almost have to tell them in the beginning, like it's, you, watch out for this or mm, maybe this is a key aspect you know hence like the interrogation scene is essentially like a shit version of narration you have literally yeah. identical scenes that just thematically tie things visually together you actually even show a spaceship coming to land like the thing which remember the detail from last episode was added that was never in the movie that also would have been a better movie if it just began with the dog running yeah I agree like essentially some of the mystique is it never starts then they try to confuse you with it and then they go back into sort never an explanation but they then give the yeah. the the whatever the transitioned in the movie becomes mm. so so normally i i think the 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 issue with some of the restructuring of this movie in theory runs afoul of some of the point of the film so i will just put this out there and say normally because the movie industry is cancer so it's <laughs> what they would do to a great movie Nor normally <laughs> You know, I'm against things. So one of the things that really tilts me about movies is when they do things like introduce the the cheating angle after you show them having this loving relationship, okay. even though mm. we know she cheated on him prior to him leaving on this mission, which is also part of the reason why he's so cold when he's leaving mm -hmm. and part of the reason she feels the guilt to go, because that's her primary motivation, right, is that this cheating was happening kind of under his nose. I even nose. think, no joke, that plays very badly if someone didn't get what we're talking about. Because if they don't understand the time jumps, they're actually going to think, like, when he leaves to actually go into the shimmer, when he's the sort of the shimmer, when he came back, he's really cold to her. But, like, that, the difference is, one was the transformed. One was, I think that would be lost, actually, on people yeah. who didn't get that angle, Monty. Yeah, and also, that yeah. it also explains why when he comes back, she's not reacting weirdly to how cold he is. Because you see later, he's cold when he left. And... Mm. You know, there's, yes. a, there's a whole undercurrent to this. So, no, But normally I hate the fact that this would be introduced later because it manipulates your emotions about certain things. But the key part of this film, and I'm trying to think of, I'm pretty sure this is accurate. I, I wasn't watching this in this lens. I thought about this later. Is that this is basically a first person narrative for Lena's character. And I don't think there's any scenes that don't have Lena in it. And I don't think we ever get any information that Lena doesn't know. And so the information is then revealed through her dreams, mostly, in which case she's dreaming about the good times that she had with her husband, which means that maybe she's trying to avoid thinking about the cheating, except when she dreams it later. So it's all done from a first person perspective, which I think is a, actually a really strong part of this movie. And so if you mm. restructure it, you might lose some of the... What, what I think is a great psychological exploration into her character where she's trying to repress some of the cheating memories and remember only the good parts of her marriage. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. I, you know, I, 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 I said earlier, you know, I don't think um, the framing device helps, but, you know, I no. understand the need to have aspects of her revealed over time i you know i sort of get that but it's I done well I, is my point because it's not yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, like yeah. it's not cynically set up where we didn't know about the cheating why we don't know about it makes sense because the movie is told from what is a first person yeah. perspective and it's about and and to the point where he's alex garland says it's about trauma that makes sense because it's about her own psychological processing of the trauma and self-destruction yeah. she created. And I do agree yeah. that the primary theme is trauma. Now, there is definitely 100% an intentional cancer reading here. There's no other sure. way to interpret it. It's very laid out on the table. But to me, again, the some of the symbolism is a little too on the nose. So, for example, you might ask yourself, why does this meteorite hit a lighthouse? Well, gentlemen, oh, a lighthouse, what, a, what, buddy, do, what, what, do tell. What, what is the purpose of a lighthouse? <laughs> Are people supposed to go to lighthouses? Oh, no, they're supposed to stay far away from lighthouses. The entire point of a lighthouse is if you do not want your ship to be destroyed, you sail away from the lighthouse, right? And yet everyone like a moth to the flame is being drawn to this lighthouse, the symbol of intentional, willful self-destruction, right? It's a little, it's a little ham-fisted. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. And look, I'll, I've got another one here you'll, you'll fuck with. The Ouroboros tattoo. Mm. 
Yes. Right. The, or, 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 oh, sorry. I say a robber. It's all robber. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, my, the my. snake eating its own tail, uh, which, by the way, is usually Very a circle. British pronunciation. Yes. <laughs> which is usually a circle, but in a, it, this is this is just how this movie works. You could have a circular Ouroboros tattoo, but no, we have to make it more obvious. An infinity symbol Ouroboros tattoo. Actually, Ouroboros already was a symbol and... of infinity. It doesn't have to be in an infinity symbol. If you actually look at the angle they film it from, it it sort of looks like cells dividing as well. That's, so. that's a, okay. Right. Fair, fair play. That's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. So anyway, right. But the, yeah, the 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 uh, 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 like it's ham fisted. I get it. But what I like is the way it's kind of not explained that the soldier in the one bit of actual body horror that's in this movie has it. Then it's it's An A Anya has it. It's right? on Is Kane it as well and Lena. Yeah, uh, but it ends. But Lena doesn't have it at the start. She gets it after the Shimmer puts it on her. Right. Right. I'm 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 correct. Yeah. Yes. So 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 what what that's saying and it's not explained. And what that's saying is, you know, obviously, like when you have people in your life, um, you're opening yourself to vulnerabilities. You might lose them. It might be awful, but there will always be a part of them on you. You know, like they leave an impression in your life. And that's the sort of visual representation of that. You know, she, Lena is changed by her very brief relationship with this person who dies, but she will always have that, right? So, I don't know. I get it. Like, it's ham-fisted. I think that's kind of... I, I fuck with that I, kind I, of there's, thing. So there's, you know. there's enough of it to notice. Like, I also noticed that the house in which they're all tied up when the, the bear attacks them for the second time looks... If it's not identical to Lena and Kane's house, it certainly looks very, very similar, very yeah. similar in terms of, yeah. like, the living room layout, the staircase placement... Um, so there, there. I think the the point is, is like the tattoo is one of those you know kind of echoes that's refracting through multiple people. And I think the cool thing about the house is, it might because we don't know if me like memory changing is a huge part of this, where they can't remember things, and mm -hmm. it's almost like yep. their memories are manifesting in reality as well, which I think is another. I wish they would have explored that more. I think you can do more with that than just show the the same house. I have yeah, a couple of things on that. One is, this is just a, a base complaint. When you put Oscar Isaacs on the billing, can he please be in the movie? You know what I mean? He's actually a really good actor. Like, he's did the same thing no, with James. He's it's in like, the first okay. fifth of the movie. Just on he's that really point. Actor. Put him in the movie. Or, or allow him here. to act. Because he's literally, I this is his face the whole movie. Yeah, he doesn't do anything. I, know. I literally, I literally wrote this down. Why the fuck is Oscar Isaacs in everything? Can we, can we? I actually want less of him. He's a mega actor. I mean, you compare this performance to Ex Machina, and it's like, you wouldn't even know it was the same dude. No, exactly. I mean, he's yeah. amazing in Ex Machina. He's so yeah, good. yeah. I mean, like he's so good as the tech bro billionaire. It's it's beyond a joke. I mean, that performance is like we will definitely watch this movie on this show. I yeah, love that movie. Yeah, yeah, I love that movie too. And 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 again, you know. Obviously, Alex Garland. We could just do an Alex Garland fucking spectacular. Sure. Honestly. Or, or I mean, look. Uh, let, let's be realistic. We almost picked Sunshine for Cosmic Horror. We, if we yeah. do an AI se an, an AI segment, we will yeah. do Ex Machina. We have to do. And if we do it's a, a definitive AI movie, really. Right. And if we do a zombie segment, we will do Twenty Eight Days Later. So I think we're going to cover yes. a bunch of Alex Garland, regardless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, this is what I mean. He is a gift to fucking cinema, whether you fuck with his film or not. And look, I, I, you know, just on the Oscar Isaac's point, and then I'll, I'll let Duncan jump back in because he, he had a couple of things he wanted to say. But I mean, like, I think Oscar Isaacs as an actor has hit that point of like oversaturation now. You know, he's in every major franchise. <laughs> he's in Dune. He's in Star Wars. <laughs> I don't know what's and going it's on. like he's such a good fucking actor, but like. I just want to see less of him, not more. Um, because I, I don't think in a lot of the movies he's been in, I don't think he's being used <laughs> particularly well either. I've got to, I've got, like, I want, I've got to say that. I think like he's wasted in a lot of the projects he's in for such a talented. I mean, dude. the joke is Keanu Reeves should have been in his position in this movie. <laughs> he would have, would have nailed it. Everyone would have been wild. He's back. <laughs> Here's the other point. One thing I like to do is another reason I don't read what the act, the author's intention is or the original story right. is because sometimes, every now and then, I actually come up with, a, as I'm watching the movie, with a better way I think it's going to end than the movie itself. So I've made a video mm, on my side, channel, yeah. very famously, about Inception like this, where as soon as in Inception, they mention that the fucking character who makes the maze is called Ariadne, and that is literally <laughs> the name of the prince 
princess in the Theseus. My, I thought, yeah. right, that's actually his daughter that goes into the dream to rescue him from limbo and lead him out of it, which is never what happens. That's that was essentially like a red herring that had nothing to do. It's just because she she knows about mazes. That's it, right? I mm. thought similarly when I was watching this movie because I thought it's so ham fisted the first part where it's like yeah. you're having this conversation. Yeah, she meets the person who's her husband and he's all really cold, a weird experience. But then you don't know is that a dream? Is that reality? Then you have this sequence where it's like. What happened inside the zone? Exposit everything. You know, that thing, right? Here's what I thought was going to be the genius twist that might have actually made this movie, like, be saved and be god tier to me. I thought at the end, the whole premises caused this, like, thing. We're all just merging and be refracting through each other genetically, thoughts, sounds, fucking radio. I thought at the end, what it would be revealed is all that first stuff, she was always in the zone slash area X. They even did, like, the whole thing of her dreams. Like, they're just recreating things from that and she's experiencing it so that the alien other can sort of like see what's going on and that the idea is even the interrogation would actually be the alien sort of asking like what are you what are you experiencing right. here what's I thought that would be like a god tier twist instead that really was just like no nah, no nah, that was just so you knew it was like she'd been inside and then <laughs> she was four weeks and it actually was just exposition like I think I want the Thorin director's cut there you go that's how <laughs> <sponsors think>. yeah. <laughs> uh, we, should, yeah, we should I talk about the end though so to describe what happens at sure. the end and this is we we described the kind of cheesy shimmer in the eyes of of Lena and Kane but what the more interesting thing is what happens at the end they do reach the lighthouse eventually they do find the meteorite hole Ventress is down there you find out that Kane killed himself there for whatever reasons he he basically says in so many words i'm going crazy my flesh is liquid my mind is unmoored or whatever nonsense he spouts then he kills himself sound sick i don't know why he's fucking hitting on that sounds wicked yeah, no, yeah. um it's got the good good oh and they did do that one part we didn't mention which was that one body horror part where they cut the soldier open yes. and he has like writhing lovecraft that was yeah. that's also what i think misled people because they were like oh my god it's like aliens are coming in like but it's like yeah, nah. not really you know not no. really not um really. so they get there and ventress is like liquefying and going crazy and then she explodes into a thousand particles and we see her turn into some sort of eyeball dimensional hole i don't know how to describe it you also saw the mm. same thing in the camera that kane had that captured it so we yes. assume one of his other party members then a drop of blood from lena goes into it and then it turns into what is effectively a copy of her and it starts mimicking all of her movements so when she's violent towards it it's violent towards her when she's gentle towards it it's gentle towards her and it kind of looks like a i don't know just a a, a prismatic shiny humanoid equivalent and then it eventually turns into her she hands it the phosphorus grenade that's has the pin pulled out it ignites goes into the lighthouse the lighthouse burns up the shimmer goes away and ventress also says pretty crucially that it doesn't really have a motivation whatever this thing is inside the lighthouse and that it doesn't want anything um so then then that's when she comes back out of the shimmer. That's when the interrogation begins. That's been cut into the entire movie so far. And she appears to be changed, as we've said, but for the most part has all the memories of what happened and, and is much more fine than Kane is. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I, again, I think the ending, it has this really, I think it's very disaffecting. I think it's got this very strange quality to it. Because I heard people complain about the CGI in this segment, and I actually don't. I think it's fine. As it, I think, I think it looks really like it is oh, weird. Really it is alien. You mean. Yeah, when I when it was pretty well done. Yeah, yeah, when it's mirroring her movements yeah. and slowly morphing into her. And right, even you know, initially, before it becomes her, looks like one of those wooden, like, puppet doll things. Yeah. That you put reminded me of that. So I actually yeah. thought that was pretty on the nose. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think it's, I think it's a solid end. I think, you know, this whole, because the film is essentially set up as a journey and we know, we know Lena has survived because of this stupid framing device. So it really <laughs> sort of, it really tempers the tension <laughs> to this segment, but you're still curious as to like what, you know, what, what's the alien going to do? What, does it have any motivations? What will the communication be like? Now, apparently in the novel, the, I think there's like, she tr she beats the alien by she thinks about suicide. I think if I remember rightly. Oh, okay. Because um, it mirrors uh, everything she thinks or does. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's some it's some shit like that. I, I, okay. It's long long time. But anyway, the um, 
the you know i i think the ending is real is really strong and i think that in it it brings together all the themes of the movie in a really cool way that it's that you know she literally defeats this manifestation of her trauma and guilt and returns but you know safe but totally changed for the experience and as a way of visually representing that that is what what is what we clinicians would say is therapy you know i think i think you're not going to find many other vi you know better visual representations of sort of defeating you know the beast of you know trauma within so i mean i, I it, it, <clears throat> yeah. To me, they did put it like the one thing they laid on a bit thick was just the American trope of like, it's all right, because actually American made guns and grenades work on everything. <laughs> and it's like the joke is, and this is why I guarantee yeah. audiences thought this. I guarantee when they saw the hole going into the central thing that's come, they thought she was going to put a nuke in there. I guarantee that was literally <laughs> in people's minds. Like, I blow it up and leave. Like essentially they think it is the thing. It isn't the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, 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 it it's a shame it's phosphorus grenades, but I think the key component is, you know, they're, obviously they are military individuals, uh, you know, that were, they've been sending into the shimmer and the grenades were used by Kane as well, you know, so it's like he's given her something to, you know, uh, kind of save the day, win the day, there's a connection there. So, you know, I get it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the ending. I, I, I think like overall, what sort of I'm astounded by is that this was like two years after the Ghostbusters remake. And here we have a movie that's all oh, women. the feminist angle, right? Okay. All scientists. Yes. And it's trying uh, to be high art. High art, right? Yeah. Talking about, talking about tra dealing with trauma. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it, this, this, the 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 fact they didn't market this movie like that is kind of like really strange um because they they tried to market it as like this action movie and it just isn't that no it and just it, isn't an action you know it's movie also it's also interesting to think about this film in the context of what we're watching on the show because last week the thing literally has an all male cast and this is now yeah. an all, basically an all female cast for you know, eighty percent of the movie. And and look, I'll I'll say about Alex. Well, the thing I love about Alex Garland as an as an artist, because keep in mind we're talking about a novelist that became a screenwriter, that became a director. This guy is just a mega talented guy. But if you look at his kind of like you know body of work, one of the things is I think he is a fantastic writer when it comes to women in particular you know this is it's very strange to me i've seen this guy criticized uh as being like you know oh you know the way he writes he, he writes some of his characters and some of his early work but again i don't see that at all i think x x machina is a fantastic example of you know fem like feminine empowerment essentially is what saves the day the 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 ai is a woman you know yep. it's a female character and, and and it's about the interplay between women and men in relationships i mean he more explicitly did this in his last film which is just called men and it's a horror <laughs> i movie. haven't seen and that yet it's fucking great <laughs> it's so good <laughs> and it's like it's about you know that that the the uh women's mindset about you know when you're surrounded by men that are physically you know strong and could do all these heinous things to you what does the world look like and so you know i, I this is a movie that is uh, you know explores a lot of themes that are uh female in conceptualization and it just never got the props or the plaudits for that you yeah. know i think in terms uh, you know and i think probably because the characters are so broad they you know they couldn't be like oh she's such a girl boss <laughs> you know <laughs> girls get the job done they couldn't do it like that and unfortunately Am americans like you said they just the american Hollywood system just really struggles when it gets a piece of art. It gets, and that's what this movie is. It is art. It might not be good art in your eyes, but well, you, it's not cheap popcorn garbage. It's I not think, throw away nonsense. I think we do have a, a counterplay to that going on in, in Hollywood right now, especially with the rise of A24. A24, A24 sure, is actually sure. making some big bangers, um, which, I'm again, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll get to some of these films. And I think that it just had to find its niche in terms of a production studio. And now, especially because A24 is like winning Best Picture Awards, I think you're going to see maybe, mm -hmm. you know, a shift back to that. But in any case, beyond the the female stuff, my actual favorite 
theme of this movie was one that was mentioned at the beginning. And this is when they're talking. So one of the talking points in Lena's lecture is that all cells, talking about cell division, came from a single cell at one point in time. Mm. And that created and shifted and mutated into the world that we know. And so I think it puts the shimmer and the alien manipulation of genes and life into perspective, because it's not that the world of the shimmer is inherently more terrifying than the world that we live in. It's just as if that process had taken a different turn, mm. as if from the first dividing cell, it had mutated differently into creatures that were doppelgangers of each other or um, you know, the alligator had had evolved differently. Right. And mm. so I think that's the for me, the coolest part of this movie is that there is a meditation on the theory of why are we scared of if evolution went differently? Right. Yeah. Because that it is a horrifying yet beautiful universe, but it's not. It's just another reality of what could have happened on Earth. And it's no more or less scary than the one that we inhabit. We just know what to be scared of in the one that we inhabit. Whereas who the fuck knows what is deadly in that world? Mm. Classic fear of the unknown as a, as a literary device. Yeah. I mean, I'll tie that together with another concept, which is obvious. Like, look, I'm not a big fan of evolutionary theory in general. I think it's already a little bit hawky as it is, but obviously it is the accepted du jour paradigm of the modern day. So everyone will be able to understand that premise. And as Monty says, essentially, if you actually conceive of a universe without God, which is essentially, it's essentially the point of evolutionary theory, then the notion would be maybe this is also just something that happens within your universe. Maybe like evolution and all genetic biomes can just be reset or refracted through introduction of like a black swan event like this, this thing comes mm. to earth and it just takes over. And the idea would be by the end, just like the thing, if they hadn't killed it, everything would have been taken over. Everything would have been assimilated. Everything would have been annihilated from what it was and made into this new thing. And there would be a new world. That's why I also agree. The thing that was a bit jarring, which is where they try to make it horror was the idea that you're always fighting it. It's always alien and terrifying to you. That's why not one thing I noticed because the cosmic horror itself it can never escape the shadow of Lovecraft, obviously. People yeah. tried to make allusions to Lovecraft in this, but beyond like slimy things and stuff like that, it doesn't really have much, but I will say the one aspect is that idea that it's a central thing, is it doesn't matter whether you die or not at the end, whether you're going to die, whether you're going to kill you, but a lot of my critics said last episode, kill themselves. It's the idea that the... It, the the reality of the world and what has happened to you, the experience is so horrifying that you no longer can it just exist or basically you have to go mad. That's the only way to actually survive it and sort of continue in the world. You have to sort of become unhinged and either become some like servant of the old ones or you just some blithering mess off in a laboratory like a like a scientist or something. But or you kill yourself. You it's so horrifying. Like you can't allow it to happen to yourself. And actually you must, it should never happen to anyone else either. Like that's the only way I thought I had any parallels to Lovecraft because I thought people I, I saw some people were trying to jam that reference in. I thought that was a little bit of a reach. Sorry, I've, I have just got a car alarm going on. No, reason. we can't hear it. It's okay. <laughs> good. You can't hear it. That's good. Yeah. So, um, so uh, there's actually a line, Duncan, uh, that that uh, that is interesting about about this in in the movie, and I I think there's like a little aspect of it to talk about like just the religious overtones of cosmic horror that you get okay. sometimes. That what cosmic horror also does is, and we talked about this when we were defining cosmic horror in the first episode, is that cosmic horror shakes you to the foundations. It makes you doubt things that you thought you knew and understood stood by presenting something that is so unknowable that yes. you know it, it makes you reframe everything you know and actually it she does say ventress at the start we don't know what this is it could be a religious event and obviously the movie okay. is so scientifically anchored you know i imagine that for a lot of people you know sort of that were aware of the shimmer the cosmic horror aspect is that they're all you know they're scientists they're very tethered to reality. It's scientists and soldiers. Soldiers, very utilitarian, just objective. We have to go, we have to do this. Scientists, you know, like everything is scientific. There is nothing outside the premise of science. And then here's something that is completely, but, you know, but, def it defies everything they think they know. Right. But here's the, I, I, you know, I don't even know if I, I necessarily agree with your take, Duncan, that like this is a, a purely you know, evolutionary or, or perspective about how things cr were created on Earth. Because I think the open-ended question that this movie leaves you with is, did this happen before? Right? Yeah, true. It, this, is, true. this is in some ways 
showing a rapid guided evolution by an alien being. But considering that we don't know the genesis well, if of- Well, people don't know, this is a point that people miss. Because whenever you do a concept that is, there is no God, which is essentially just a fill in for supernatural components that we don't yet know. If there's no God and you scientifically explain things using evolutionary terms, that's why if it gets back to it, the line that someone can always say to you and make you sound silly is, so you believe one day a rock essentially one day began to think and become alive. Because that is literally what the original conception of, there's the primord primordial ooze, and then from that lightning strikes it, and then you get the RNA and the DNA. So if you don't want that, what they did in the modern day, to buttress the theory and make it sound better is they do the panspermia idea, which is essentially what I thought they were implying at the beginning with the landing, mm. which you don't really know what it is. It's the idea that, like, they claim that, like, for example, spores of mushrooms, for example, can actually survive in outer space. So as a result, in theory, you could have a ah, comet right. come from another planet or world, land on Earth, and then the spores could, like, sort of grow out in our atmosphere and they become a life form. It's actually one of Terence McKenna's, like, Bo things he would tie switches into. Body as well, yeah. yeah. Similar concepts. It's like the yeah. idea that, like, like the fungi itself, because it has some sort of weird insight. Maybe that is the alien from the other planet, you know? So essentially th that's another idea that you use to expand out and be improve your odds that this could all be real. It's like, right, mm. life came from another part of the galaxy. And so since we don't know where that is, it puts the story over here. You don't have to worry about explaining it now. You've sort of put the exposition behind where we haven't gone yet. So to me, I thought that was the parallel that they did there with that this thing lands like that and then affects all the world. Like, because that's the premise. If people don't get it, they really can only think of evolution after it's like, right, so you get the monkey in to me, right, cool, I'm good with that, or like, right, <laughs> the fish goes on the beach, and then it becomes like, you know, a fucking like raccoon or whatever. They can get that, but they can never put their mind back like this, to what would the genesis point be? What would the first forms be? By the way, in that scenario, your premise is there was nothing, there was no life except plant life, potentially. And so there was plant life, and then living things begin, and then they start as the fish, and then they come as like, it's like, that, that is self, people don't realise what a radical concept that is. It's why, since I'm not that into it, to me, that's a mega sci-fi concept. That's a that's a fucking movie out there. I mean, spoiler, it is. It's called The Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. But, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a radical fucking notion, right. you know. Like, it's actually, everyone accepts that it's just everyday reality. That's pretty wild. That's pretty out there as a fucking take, guys. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Uh, this, is, this is all to say that I think that this would have been a more interesting, heavily, like, I had to, you know, I this is my interpretation of some of the other, you know, uh, yeah. crumbs that they dropped along the way. But I think it would have been a stronger movie to incorporate more of that theme into it because I think that's what the most to me the most interesting parts of this film are the cosmic horror elements where it is you don't know it says it, they explicitly say it doesn't have a motive and it's mm. just changing this and it's a question of whether it's even a problem like is it a problem if it takes over the whole world yeah and changes I mean, everything is it yeah, like I I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> And that is the inevitable. That is the inevitable outcome. I mean, again, they make that abundantly clear. It's expanding. It's hit the lighthouse. The shimmer yep. is expanding. We've got it contained for now. No one notices it, but in a few months, it's going to be on on the threshold of civilization. We won't be able to cover it up anymore. And Natalie Portman's mission is the eleventh mission to find out. You know, and they specifically take yeah, this approach. But it, of, but it, it and she basically yeah. murders a new world that we don't know whether it's better or worse for the safety of the old world because of the fear of the unknown. And sure, that's much sure. more interesting to me than a lot of the really like blatant shit they try and pull on you in this movie. By the way, yeah. just to pull back the curtain, I do like to let people behind the fourth wall. The reason why when Richard suggested this and we were deciding which four movies are in the four play, right? I had also seen this before, but I gave no, I was poke of it. I never gave any clue what I think. I let Richard just go, it's Megan. I was like, oh yeah, we could watch that. And then I knew Monty hadn't watched it, right? So I thought, right, this would be interesting because I knew already I'm probably not going to like it when I rewatch it. I'm not going to get into it. But I actually let this happen because I want a feature of this show to be, not only are we introducing the fancy sure. movies, but every now and then we saw of have like the opposite of a veto we can just forcibly insert a movie we want whether other people like it or not and that's something i plan to do later so i'm gonna pull my card later i'm keeping my galaxy on free card for now because later in another series i might just make you guys watch a movie even no, if I, you I, hate it I, 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 I love that i mean look, i just yeah. sent you guys i just because I, I know we're getting close to wrapping up yep. but i i just sent you guys the poster right and 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 so understand why i chose this movie is it the best movie in Cosmic Horror? Absolutely not. Is it the best movie of 2018? Absolutely not. Might not even be a top 10 movie from that year. But the point is, in terms of it being like a love letter to adaptation, 
and how you can take source material and, and, and an artist can have a radically different interpretation of it. And even to the point of imprinting on it, maybe a different meaning to the original novelist's intent. Um, and, and it's very rare to see an American movie this drenched in metaphors and allegories and similes and all that. And, you know, the language of cinema, I, I, I think it's a fascinating movie that will probably be studied for years and years and then look at how they market it. Oh, by the way, this is Look everything I hate about America. Because what's great is when I watch this, first of all, tagline, fuck you, marketing. Bill Gix was right about what you want me to do. The idea that the tagline of this movie, after you watch it, is fear yeah, what's, fear inside. what's inside. inside. And then the actual image, which, look, could just be the shimmer, that looks like Predator or something's hiding, like, oh, I'm going to get them when they come near me. Yeah, oh, yeah. I hate everything and about this. Guns in and the and apartments and the thing. And, 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 you know, this is why, this is another reason why I chose the movie, because I knew we were going to do the thing. And and obviously the original idea about the thing was, you know, man is the best place to hide was the tagline before they, you know, got squeamish and didn't want to do that. And then this movie is marked as if, as if it is the thing, <laughs> the modern update yes. of the thing, that there's an alien out there and it's going to get in you. And you better kill it, Natalie, kill it, Natalie. And it's like, the, the film is not that. That's and wild. it's like, look at that poster. And it's like, no wonder people fucking hated this film. They probably, like this film, by the way, it, it lost 10 million at the box office compared to what it cost to make. And it's like, can you, can you imagine if you're the type of motherfucker who looks at that poster and goes, Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> and you go and see this film. You're in for a bad fucking time. And Probably I think the joke is let me, happened. let me do the cynical, like eighties movie trailer, trailer version of it where you butcher it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, so, cause what I would do in just to do a callback is I would actually have a scene where the one line that Isaac, Oscar Isaac still says, he goes, cheat your bitch. Let's do our final takes on this. So as I yeah. said at the start, I think I'm really glad I watched this movie, not because I think it's the greatest movie ever, because it's really fun to talk about. And it does mm. at least it's trying to be ambitious, right? There there are clear things that it's trying to do. There is a multifaceted way of looking at the themes of the movie and the symbolism of the movie. There's multiple ways to read it, which is intended. And it is attempting to be a work of art, right? Do I think it's the worst Alex Garland movie I've seen? Yes, I do. But he set a very high bar, so that's not an insult. Uh, but I, I still, I, I don't know if I'd watch it again. Uh, but it was it was interesting to think about, and it's interesting to discuss, even if it does have some two on the nose moments, and I think ultimately kind of fails in executing its vision. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for me, again, like what, why I recommend this movie to people uh, and, and then they never call me again uh, <laughs> afterwards <laughs> is because, you know, it, 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 it's a movie that stays with you. I think in the modern era of cinema, you know, so we're talking the last like, you know, five, six years, like where we're at now, with the exception of the A24 movies, which, you know, they, they, they pick interesting projects. The, the bland slop you are served up at this endless procession of franchise films, they don't stay with you. I can't differentiate between, like, you know, anything Marvel or Disney or you know, even shit. just some... Yeah, or even just some of the action movies I've seen. They, 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 were, they were just... Really, there's nothing wrong with this, by the way, but they would just throw away escapism. There's nothing to think about. There's nothing to do. You just don't ever watch the film again. You fill in the time. And what Annihilation does, you know, when it comes out in 2018, when if you look at movies that were released that year, you know, it's not like, you know, not there's, there's some, all the box office smashes are all the studio garbage you would expect. It stays with you. It makes you think. You notice things. You, you know, it's like any movie that you're still thinking about three days later it has done something. And, you know, and I'm not going to get all high art at the moment ago, just like how trauma changes you. This movie, cha I'm not going to do that. Right. And but, by the way, in the biggest movie was Avengers Infinity War in 2018. Yes, there you go. I mean, it's like, I, and I can't tell you anything about that film. I can't tell you anything <laughs> you, about do, it. I don't do you know what the anything. top three movies were? You ready for this? Avengers Infinity War, Black Panther, and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. 
just okay. help me help me hollywood like <laughs> hell, give me something and that's what i mean and it, it's it's like listen i know a ton of people who are watching this podcast have watched this movie to like watch along with us i've seen so many comments about it and like i said people have been messaging me saying you're gonna dunk on this movie i guarantee all of you who've watched it you're thinking about shit right you know all, all week after you watched it and that experience yeah. that it gives you is something Great. precious in a fucking timeline where everything is trash <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it sweet and short. I'll just say, I think, like I say, to me, it, it, essentially, if someone's young and they've never seen the movies I'm referencing, the Tarkovsky movies, they've never seen the thing, maybe they didn't watch last week's episode. I actually think if it's like your first ever experience, look, you're probably not going to like it, but it will be an extremely unique movie. Like if you had no reference points whatsoever, I, look, I think you'd have a very hard time coming into the movie because even the things they show exposition wise are a little bit heavy handed and sort of only give you the sort of start point. They don't really give you a conclusion. But I do think, like I said, I don't think it is a bad movie. I just don't think it is like a good movie. It wouldn't be one of my favorites. Like I said, I probably wouldn't have rewatched it, but I, it was worth watching once. And that's why I draw a parallel to like a drug experience, for example. I think essentially it's just, you want to have an experience. Part of that, by the way, is the notion. It might not all be stuff you like. It might not all be things you understand. It might change you, but not always in the way that maybe you wanted. All change and progress isn't necessarily good. It's just change, isn't it? That's Change is just the ultimate justifier of itself. So, like I say, to me, it's not like X-Machine. X-Machine is a very good movie, scripted well with characters and dialogue. Like That's a very different type of movie. But I did think it was sort of worth it as a one-off experience. That's why I say I think that, that's why I was also cool with it being included as one of the four. All right. Probably the most challenging, easy of the four. Yeah, uh, we've got Event Horizon coming up next week, uh, which is... <laughs> what about total whiplash? Yeah, that's oh going to be... Oh, my God. By the way, you know, uh, for... Annihilation is a little bit harder to put into the cosmic horror because it's more existential about change, whereas Event Horizon is very much a horror movie. Um, so we'll, we'll enjoy that. Uh, and then after that, we'll be from beyond before we go into 1980s Vampire, which I'm really looking forward to because... I low-key love Lost Boys and uh, Near Dark, so those are going to be really fun. A landmark in gay cinema. Can't wait to talk about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, that, that's legit. <laughs> uh, interesting. All right. Uh, we'll see you guys next week with Event Horizon. Mm -hmm.